Thank you, everyone. So that's the difference how we talk about things. When I said I like riding bikes, that meant I ri like riding motorcycles. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but that is fine. That is not important here right now, I believe. So uh, thanks for coming to this talk. I could see uh, some of uh, my students from the uh, three-day class. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. I, uh, you didn't, did you not have enough of me? I mean, <laughs> So, uh, I'm going to talk about, the, the talk title is of course a cool one, on premises bypassing MDI, Microsoft's Defender for Identity. What's that? Uh, before that, uh, let me uh, make a quick introduction of me. So you can find me on Twitter as Nikhil underscore i -T. I'm the founder of Altered Security. We are a hands-on enterprise learning organization. We focus on Active Directory and Azure Security as of now, laser sharp focus. You can find me on GitHub as Samrat Ashok. Uh, I used to maintain uh, multiple open source tools uh, like Nishang, Deploy Deception, et cetera, uh, but not anymore. That's, that's a, a hell of stressful thing to do. Uh, I'm very much interested in Active Directory security. I've worked a lot on partial security, on-prem, that is Active Directory and Azure security. Mostly how to break into stuff where, uh, of course, I have the permission to do so. I've previously spoken multiple times at uh, DEF CON main stage, DEF CON villages, uh, different versions of Black Hat. I regularly speak and train at BrewCon. I think this is my sixth year consecutively to BrewCon. I mean, when it was, everything was locked down, we were doing it uh, virtually. Uh, what we are going to take a look at is, of course, very, very quickly we'll understand or try to understand what MDI is, what it tries to address, what are the threats that it tries to detect uh, in form of alerts? So we'll look at some of the alerts, the more interesting ones. Then we'll see how we can bypass the alerts that MDI flags that, okay, this is not good. That is, we'll see how we can bypass that. Then some of the techniques that uh, are still not detected. So MDI is... Uh, from the lineage of what used to be ATA, Advanced Threat Analytics. I, I spoke about it like at Brucon and Black Hat like five years ago. And a lot of stuff, interestingly, is still the same or similar. So we'll see that there are some things that are still not detected. There are some techniques that MDI does not absolutely care about. Uh, then recently, uh, response actions were introduced in MDI with the help of uh, 365 Defender, that you can take some actions. If you see that there is something fishy going on, you can actually take some action. So we'll see that, are there any possibilities to abuse that? There is at least one. And then we'll, of course, discuss the limitations of the research that whatever I'm going to present, what was the setup for that? So what is MDI? Think of it as something of sitting between all the traffic that goes through from and to, uh, to your domain controllers and ADFS servers. Usually still the focus is on domain controllers. You run a sensor on your domain controllers that keep learning, that keep analyzing logs and traffic. So what kind of traffic? LDAP, DNS, Kerberos, SAMR. If this traffic, all of this traffic that goes to and from to the DCs, wherever you have the sensor set up, it creates profiles for identities. It would understand that, okay, this guy, user one, he, he or she or they, they always log in from a particular machine. This is the activity that they do. This is how their Kerberos or LDAP traffic looks like. So it creates a profile for all the identities, users, groups, machines. Uh, the usual learning time, it differs a lot for different kind of alerts, but you can take it, uh, give and take, a month. Right? So it is a month when you set it up. It takes a month to understand it. it. Uses the cloud and machine learning to build profiles. And of course, send stuff to the cloud. That is, that is understood here. Now, once the profiles are set, it starts looking for anomalies. That, okay, I see you. You, you never used, let's say, a TGT, a ticket-granting ticket that uses RC4. But here you have. That is the kind of stuff that MDI starts alerting you about. That is, any deviation from the normal behavior, you have an anomaly, there would be a detection. Now, the alerts are split into uh, different phases of uh, 
of an attack or a kill chain, recon, compromised credentials, lateral movement, domain dominance, and exfiltration. So MDI was previously known as ATP. Prior to that, it was ATA. The, the focus has always been on domain dominance. That is, if you have escalated your privileges, if you have compromised some high privilege accounts, then how do you hold on to them? If you hold on to them, then ATA would be there. So domain dominance is something that ATA focuses a lot on. Now, recently, it has also started going for the recon phase. That is, to, to try and stop a threat actor or an attacker right there in the beginning. So that has been very interesting to look at, actually. So how do you bypass? I mean, I plan to have this and the next one, the, the open discussion on MDI. I wanted to have it actually later on, but figured out that it would be better if we discuss it earlier before we start looking at individual alerts or bypasses. So please keep this in mind. MDI is designed, it is supposed to detect careless attackers. That is, if you see a cool tool or technique that someone shared on GitHub, let's say, don't try it in a production environment, of course, right away. Right? Why? If, once again, if there is a deviation what ATA has learned, then there would be a detection. Please keep in mind that endpoint OPSEC is not all the OPSEC. This is something that I've seen even, you know, the, the alpha red teams, the better ones, even for them, this is a very common uh, trait. I would not call it, call it a shortcoming or, or anything bad, but yeah, it's, it's a common trait. We focus a lot on the endpoint protection that is, okay, what is it? It is MD or CrowdStrike or whatever it is. What is the EDR on a machine? For example, you would have tools like, let's say, Seatbelt or others for, uh, for the foothold. Uh, situational awareness, said, okay, what is it running there? Have you seen, have you tried to check if there is in any network or specifically identity-based detection? So please keep that in mind that endpoint OPSEC is not the only OPSEC. You need not only take care of what you trigger on a machine, but also on the identity part. All right, and if you mix this up, because now it looks like that MDI is being brought closer to other Microsoft detection mechanisms in cloud, in Azure. So for Azure, when, it, when we talk about Azure, Microsoft treats identity as the perimeter. That is what you, uh, you probe, that is what you compromise, that is what you use. So please keep that in mind, that endpoint OPSEC is not the only thing that you should keep in mind, right? that you should care about. Uh, yeah, and as I said, do not run simply a tool because because you find it to be, to be cool or if it is new. Understand how it interacts with the DC, right? Is it generating a lot of traffic? Is it running so pointed queries that stand out? Gel in with the environment, that should be the goal. If you do that, then MDI would not even have a whiff, as we'd see. And always assume Always assume that DCs are monitored, right? So I, I, I wrote this point. I'm, I'm make, making this point because I think that there is a fundamental problem how good attackers, at least, approach compromising an, an environment. That's, there is a certain high-handedness when we approach an environment that, okay, let's deal with these idiots. So, <laughs> so don't do that, right? Assume that at least the domain controllers, even if, if it doesn't look like at the top, assume that the domain controllers are going to be well-kept and well-monitored. Do not make assumptions that, the, the, for example, for whatever the reason the organization that you are targeting has no monitoring or anything like that on the DCs. Now, when it comes to specifically to TTPs, some important things to keep in mind. Always question, what are you running? So for example, does the traffic that your tool or technique generates, does it that gel in with the existing one? For example, are there too many 4624s logons that you're leaving on, on multiple machines, hunting for, let's say, local admin? You run a query using Bloodhound or any of your tool. I mean, I like Bloodhound, but in this case, it is very noisy. So any tool, if you're running it, is it leaving too many, is it creating a traffic 
that stands out. Always keep that in mind. Uh, the second one, pretty interesting. Are you using RC4? I mean, please, we say, I mean, as an attacker, we always say that, okay, look at this environment. They are still using 2003, Server 2003, for example. Since Server 2008, AES rules, usually, AES rules any environment. It is that what is used. So don't use RC4 for replaying your credentials. That would be very detectable, not only by MDI. Anything that looks at it would know it right away. I mean, even if someone is running a simple Wireshark on the DC and passes that traffic, they would even they would know that, right? So there's nothing magical that MDI does in this case. So make sure that you use AES. It has been close to 15 years now since AES has been used a lot in, in Kerberos or therefore LDAP. Now, one thing that I specifically found out while working on this talk was MDI does not like you making pointed, pointed LDAP queries anymore, right? So what used to be, even my recommendation, the last talk that I, that I gave at Brucon was about creating deceptions, decoy accounts in Active Directory. So I, I distinctly remember my, my focus on that class, uh, on the, in the talk was, if there is a tool that requests too many attributes for an Active Directory object, that's not normal. Turns out that MDI creates an, uh, something exactly opposite to that. If you're requesting all the attributes from an object and then filtering stuff offline, MDI is absolutely fine with it. But if you're running pointed queries that, okay, bring me the users who have resource-based constraint delegation enabled, detection. That is what it is. I mean, pretty interesting. Probably the, this would, in future, couple, uh, they would couple this up with MDE, the Defender for Endpoint. So if you're requesting all the attributes, still you're detected. If you're going for specific attributes, still, that's not a good thing. So probably that is going to be the future. Doesn't look very bright to me. <laughs> so one more thing is logs. So as I said, if you are, let's say, hunting for local admins or doing something that needs you to touch all the member machines or a large number of member machines in a domain, what is the type of log that you're leaving? Is that pretty normal? Is a 4672 admin logon on the domain controller for a domain admin from your machine, from your foothold, is that normal? It's not. If you're, let's say, using domain admin credentials, you are replaying that for the very first time from your foothold machine, that's not normal, that's an anomaly, and that would be detected. In fact, it was this one that I could not bypass, even when I tried. If I'm replaying credentials of a user that has never logged on to a machine, then there is no way that you can, I mean, in my experiments, there was no way to avoid that. So that's a very interesting, and once again, uh, this is the reason we are discussing it before jumping into the alerts. This is not something very specific to MDI. Even a seam that is well-tuned would detect most of this. But yeah, if you can use it just by running an executable and getting a fancy console, then that works as well. In any case, the detection is the key. Now, one more thing is the second last one. When you're forging or creating tickets, Kerberos tickets, or when you're playing with them, make sure that they are compliant with the Kerberos policy. So for example, still, even uh, in 2022, uh, when you're using Mimikarts or any of its variants or anything, anything that has the capability to force the tickets, you would still, are you checking what is the Kerberos policy in the target environment? So the one that comes baked in, in Active Directory, that is 10 hours for the ticket lifetime, seven days for renewal. So make sure if that is the one, then your tickets are compliant with this. Otherwise, there would be a detection. Also, since I believe October 2020, if I'm not wrong, or 2021, you cannot create a golden ticket for non-existent account. Prior to that, it was possible. So for 20 minutes, you would not, uh, if you create a golden ticket for even a non-existent account, it would work, not anymore. I believe it was October 2021. Do not, I do not recall the patch exactly. But that was patched. Uh, prior to that, I mean, if you're creating a golden ticket with the username, let's say, who's your mama, so th that looks cool, but that stands out. So don't do that. 
uh, that is also something that uh, we should keep in mind. That is always ask how to be more silent. You would know. For example, if you are running Rubius to Kerberos to, to get uh, TGSs that you can Kerberos, you would know that this is noisy. You would understand, okay, if I'm requesting, let's say, 135K uh, TGSs, that is service tickets, that is noisy. You would know that. So if you, if you feel that, okay, this is this right? No, that's not right then. If you feel like that it would generate a traffic, would this be, as always assume, would this be detected? Answer, yes. So with these minor things, very easy to spot things. I mean, when you look at it, you would see that, okay, this is uh, pretty simple. When it is in front of you, that looks pretty simple, and it is. Just keep in mind very simple things, very small things. So this and the prior one, these two things together, you could not only avoid MDI, I would not take names, but other identity protection tools as well. So some recon alerts, please keep in mind that we have not, I have not tested all of them. The ones that I believe are a bit more harder to trigger. I mean, for example, the second one that we have here, which triggers when you use net.exe, that's where we stop. I mean, no brute force related alerts, etc. That is something I've not tested, not recommended at all. So for the very first one, the alert is Active Directory Attributes Freecon. So I was able to trigger this when I was looking for resource-based constraint delegation and Kerberos pre-authentication disabled. What is the way to avoid it? Uh, request all the attributes and filter them offline, and it is absolutely fine. For SAMR, don't use it, is the way to bypass. Right? Don't use NAT or NAT1, that's, that's not recommended. Another interesting one is the third one, and this is something that has been carried over since the times of ATA. So at least six years, it has been the same thing. If you run NAT session enumeration against the DC, if you want, want to list the sessions on the DC, then you would trigger this, otherwise you won't because that's the direct communication with the machine. DC is not involved if you are running it on a member machine. So for example, this is what the alert looks like. And I have internet connection, so I believe I could show you it right away. Uh, I'll do that for the next ones, actually. So this is what the alert looks like, both for RBCD and uh, pre-auth disabled enumeration. What is the way out? Let's say you want, you can use tools like, let's say, the AD module, even PowerView, or whatever you want. I mean, I'm, I usually use AD module. That's why that there is an example for that. We can request all the attributes and then filter it on the machine, on our foothold. That is the something that is running on the DC would simply see, look at that, okay, a machine or a user requested some information. That is what all that would, would be visible. So this bypasses that. Uh, for compromised credentials, uh, three of them I found more most interesting. One was the Honey Token activity. So MDI provides you the capability to mark a user as Honey Token. So that is, you create, create a decoy user, you mark it as a Honey account or Honey Token account. And if there is any interaction like credential reuse, et cetera, of that account, then there would be an alert. So for this, I mean, this is one of, one, of, one of the things that I've worked a lot on. Absolutely always check if an account is an active account. Look at the properties like logon count or account and bad, bad password count of a user before you, let's say, try to replace credentials. You don't want to use a dormant account or, of course, a decoy account, right? Logon count is usually the best uh, indicator that whether an account is an active one or not, or if it is a decoy or not. Go couple it up with bad password count, etc., cetera, and, and you would be able to spot that. So that's, that is something. I mean, do not rush for domain admin. You don't need it before lunch, right? So do so not rush for it. Check if you are in the right direction. Now, of course, the second one that we have here, suspected Kerberos XP and expo exposure. So Kerberosting is something that is considered usually to be pretty silent. When you're running Kerberosting, you leave just one 4769 Kerberos ticket requested on the DC. 
which runs in thousands, at least if not hundreds of thousands in any production environment. So pretty hard to spot. Of course, there are ways to look at encryption type, etc. And that is what MDI also does. In your 4769, what is two things actually? One is, in fact, I'm, uh, let me take my, uh, back my words, that used to be with up to ATP. Now, encryption downgrade for curb roasting that has been actually removed from MDI. So the, the current detection that we have is, if you, if you use, let's say, run Rubius curb roast, that one, what Rubius does by default, if you run it like that, is it would check if there are multiple users with SPN and it would request a service ticket or a TGS ticket for that in quick succession. That's an anomaly, right? That's, that's pretty uh, obvious that it is not a normal activity, right? So that's what an alert is. How do you avoid that? As we did here. You look for, you request all the properties and then look for them offline. Same goes for ASRF roasting. So for Kerberos SPN, SPN exposure, this one, this is the one that I was, I triggered, I just, whoops. Okay, that's why I have uh, screenshots. So <laughs> if you have Kerberos SPN exposure, that means that someone requested service tickets, that is TGS tickets in quick succession. So how do we avoid that? Do, I mean, there is no need to use a battering ram here, right? Simply enumerate using the first command, see what all users have or service principle name and request or take it one at a time. More than that, an MDI doesn't like it. A pretty easy bypass. Just, we just need to be a bit a bit smart, I mean, no need to modify your TTPs at all. So, I was expecting, I was not expecting this because I do have connection here. Uh, let me, okay, just give me a second, let me try it from a new uh, browser so that I can show you that. Now, let me run the, I just looked at time, so let me run the recording of this. So I recorded it just like, what, a uh, couple of hours back? So, you know, uh, procrastinating to, to the max. So, the idea is pretty simple. If you run a Rubius curb roast like this, uh, there would be an alert, right? So we trigger the detection first. Uh, and then, once we see that there is a detection, we go ahead and enumerate it manually. Okay, that's pretty fast. I, I could not, just give me a second. Okay, that's, we are still triggering that. So if you run it like this, this triggers a Kerberos SPN exposure. Four of the users, if you could see here. And that is what uh, MD I would alert about. So there would be a pause here because it takes like a few minutes before it shows up. No, that's not the one. That's what even I was wondering when I was recording this. Uh, and yeah, that's where I pause it. And then we have it. You would see that four accounts. That's what it complains about as well. Right, so when we ran it, We saw that there are four Kerberostable accounts here. Right, and that is what uh, MDI complains about as well. That is, buddy, you were too fast. That's, that's what it says simply. So we enumerate it uh, manually and then request it one account at a time. So that's, I mean, of course, that is slower, but that is uh, a lot more silent. So yeah, we enumerate that using the AD module or whatever you want. I personally use AD module because that's signed by Microsoft, works even with partial CLM, and now I'm used to it. So here we are enum enumerating that, we import the module 
then we look for those users whose service principal name is not set to true. That means that they are treated as service accounts. We would found out uh, four of them. Again, of course, that's, that enumeration by Rubius is, of course, not wrong. So we'll find out that there are four of them. The one that we are interested in here is an account called SVC admin. That's the account that we are going to Kerberos now. Once again, using Rubius. This time, in place of running Kerberos simply, I mean, and this is pretty well documented if you look at GitHub of, of Rubius. The RC4 OPSEC, that's a different thing. That's not detected anymore. But if you go for a single account, so there's a typo here that, that I have to change to SVC admin. And you would still have it, but without detection. I mean, no detection for this one. Just because we were a bit more careful. Uh, now, lateral movement is something that, that is one uh, phase where MDI is lacking in a number of alerts. I mean, there are many, but most of them are for patchable vulnerabilities that are pretty common. However, I mean, why I say that it is lacking there? There are three alerts that I was really interested in. One was pass the ticket. That is, you extract a user or identity's TGT from somewhere else and use it on your foothold. I was unable to trigger it reliably. So what I tried in this case was, let's say you have a domain admin logged on to a DC. I extracted the TGT from there and used it from my foothold. Uh, no alert, no detection. I mean, I'm not sure if it was my lab or what. Uh, then I extracted it from a machine, another machine, use it on another member server. Then it was alerted. I mean, it, the alert was there once, but that's it. So not sure that what was going on here. So yeah, here we don't know if we can bypass it or not. I could not reliably trigger it. The one that I could not was overpass the hash if you are using a credential for an account that never ever logged on from your foothold. That was something that I was unable to bypass. So let's say you use, you use overpass the hash for, let's say a domain admin from your foothold. You use AES keys, et cetera, whatever you can. But there would still be a detection that uh, no previous logon was observed in the past 30 days for this account from this machine. So that, that makes sense. That is something that I was not able to bypass. Interestingly, MDI no longer alerts if you are using RC4, that is NTLM hash for overpass the hash. That used to be like staple of it when, uh, as long as it was up to at least ATP. But there are no alerts documented and no alerts fired, even if you are using RC4. I'm not sure what is the reason behind that, but that would be interesting to know why this one does not get triggered anymore. It used to be, not anymore. Uh, another one that I was interested in is the use of rogue Kerberos certificate, but this is also something that I could not trigger. I requested tickets of domain admin, enterprise admins, use it from multiple machines. Once again, no trigger on this. So this is probably something that was uh, just put out to kill a bit of noise on ADCS abuse, but it was never like really well created or something, but that's how it is. Now, when it comes to domain dominance, as I said, this is something that MDI actually tries to tackle a lot, like really aggressively. So one thing that I, that always annoyed me was up to, I think a couple of years back, if you were using WinRM or partial remoting, it was not detected. But now if you're using, of course, PS exec or WMI or remote WMI connection or WinRM, that is if you're using the, the raw WinRM or if you're using partial remoting, or even if you're creating a service, all of that is detected. So four command execution methods. DCOM gets detected as well because it is at the end a remote RPC, remote WMI. What still goes undetected interestingly is if you modify an existing service, you can simply use even uh, the built-in sc.exe for that. 
if you have the permissions, just modify an existing service, make some changes to it. That is, change its bin path, change the executable for the service. And MDI is absolutely fine with it. For example, uh, an open source tool, SC Shell, a bit dated now, I think a couple of years old, that still perfectly works for this. Absolutely no detection. Uh, one more, so this is pretty interesting because this is not a high uh, level alert in MDI, but that is pretty uh, regularly detected. I mean, pretty with, with, a, with a lot of confidence. Very less number of false positives. Of course, in a production environment, it would have more, but pretty reliable. One more thing was uh, is DC sync. Now, DC sync is something that MDI goes crazy with. All right, high confidence, high alert. Why is it triggered? If there is a non-domain controller that sends a replication request, which makes sense. Non-domain controller machines, I mean, DCs or, or domain controllers can send replication requests to each other, but not other machines or users. That doesn't make sense, at least to MDI. So how do you avoid this detection? Simply by impersonating a DC. There are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, if you have high enough privileges, because we're talking about domain dominance right now, you can, let's say, uh, use the DC credentials, the, D the DC machine account credentials. You can uh, use the TGT of the DC if you can get your hands on to that. You can very simply forge a TGT that has a SID history. And this also uh, comes from the time of ATA. That has always been the case, like for six years now. If you have extra SIDs, that is SID history of domain controllers or the enterprise domain controllers, MDI would be fine with that. We'll see that. So that is how uh, you do that. In addition to that, let's say if you have uh, accounts like Azure AD Connect or SharePoint admins that are allowed to run replication, then it would be fine as well. Uh, three more interesting set of Three more interesting alerts. I'm uh, putting them together. Uh, encryption downgrade, non-existent account, and time anomaly. So for all of these three, make sure this is for the golden ticket. If you are creating a golden ticket using RC4 of the KRB TGT, stop doing that. That has been detected since 2016. Right? So always use AES keys. Please keep that in mind. Secondly, <coughs> Creating a golden ticket for non-existing account doesn't work anymore. But that would trigger a detection. So that would be a double whammy, right? You, you don't even get to have a, a valid ticket, and you would still be detected. So that, doesn't, that would, look, would not look good in the debriefing. So, so don't do that. Always go for a valid active account. That, that makes sense. Also, the time an anomaly that uh, triggers in two cases, actually. One, if you let's say if you use Mimikars directly, that creates a, a ticket that is valid for 10 years and has a renewal period of 10 years. Don't do that. Go for whatever is configured in the target environment. In addition to that, do not leave your tickets in memory of a machine. That is both a part of house cleaning, once you are done with whatever activity you are doing, and part of OPSEC. So let's say if you create a very valid, very sweet set TGT that complies with whatever the policy is there in the target environment. But if you leave it in in memory of your foothold, you forget to purge it or remove it, and you leave it in memory of your foothold, if the process for some reason tries to validate that TGT with the DC, there would be a detection. So even if you were not using that, it would still lead to a detection. So always keep that in mind that you purge them or remove the tickets. That would help. What do the detections look like for remote code execution? So these are the four methods that uh, MDI detects. Let's say we start uh, and overpass, we use overpass the hash to start a process as say, let's say a domain admin. Then we use SC shell to modify an existing service that is absolutely not detected. And this is something that I have actively, all of the domain dominance actually, that I actively tested in production environments, of course with permission. and <laughs> Nowhere was it triggered. Absolutely not. So what we are doing, that's, that's pretty uh, 
simple that we are doing. We are deliberately use, going as noisy as we can. So if I show you uh, the demonstration for this one, uh, that's remote code execution. So, so we are. You would notice that we are deliberately using a partial reverse shell because that is very noisy, or at least considered to be noisy, even if it is not. That's not cool anymore. So uh, we start a listener, and then we start a process with the privileges of a domain admin. So that was our listener. Here, we use. Rubius to start a process with the privileges of a domain admin. This runs as the domain admin. Now here, if we use sc-shell.exe to run a partial reverse shell, even that would not be detected. What are we doing here? Uh, Using SC shell, we are modifying on DCOP DC, that is the domain controller of my lab that I was using. We are modifying XBL auth manager. This is the example that you will find on the GitHub repo of SC shell. It's, it's, it's that simple, right? And then we are simply asking it to change the executable path, the bin path of the service to our payload. So when you run this, That's our payload. Now when you run this, you would see that this was the original service path, and that has been replaced by our payload. And we immediately got a connect back. And just to be absolutely sure, I mean, this is something I tested, as I said, in, in a few production environments as well. I deliberately ran noisy commands, like who am I host him that are supposed to be, to be noisy. Not uh, you are not supposed to use them right away, but I mean absolutely nothing. In fact, that's not captured in in this video. I even tried even more, uh, you know, uh, stupid things like trying to run partial remoting from here. That somehow it gets triggered. No, MDI doesn't care, right? So because it has no detection logic for it, I believe. So that was about remote code execution. For DC sync, make sure that you impersonate a domain controller, and you would be fine. Uh, so by default, domain controllers and enterprise domain controllers, these two set of uh, groups or identities have those rights. There could be a few more, depending on, but by default, these have. Mm -hmm. So if you run DC sync using the credentials of a domain controller or a silver ticket, or if you have extra SIDs that, that impersonates a DC, then you would be absolutely fine. So how can you do that? Silver ticket is something, I mean, we will come back to this a, a momentary later on as well. That is the best stuff that you have against MDI. Right? You don't need to talk to the damn DC. There would be no detection at all. Very, very silent. In fact, it is so silent. I mean, the reason is MDI doesn't care about the the Kerberos message type that is used here. So even if you run a silver ticket against the DC, where the MDI sensors are running, it would still not detect it. So that's, that's like an evergreen bypass. And once again, that has been the case for past six years. I mean, not this time. Last time when I did it, I duly reported it to Microsoft, worked with their team. They fixed some of the stuff that was back in 2017. They fixed some of the stuff, but yeah, they know it. I mean, I hope, right? I, I do not work with vendors a lot anymore because that's very frustrating. But uh, yeah, I mean, at, at least at that time, they, they knew it. Uh, other than that, you can get a TGT of the DC, let's say, by abusing unconstrained delegation. Just throwing out ideas how you can get the identity of a DC. One very well-known method is, I think, uh, Benjamin, the, uh, of course you know Benjamin, right? Who wrote Mimikatz. Be uh, Benjamin, I think, tweeted about this back in 2017, 16. Extra SIDs, that is SID history. If you inject a SID history of domain controllers or enterprise domain controllers in your golden ticket, MDI is fine with it. Because what, I mean, always try to see MDI's side 
what they look for, okay, they, here is a TGT. What is the account that is requesting replication? Okay, this is a DC. Next. That is their profiling, their regular activity would show you that, okay, I know that the domain controller would send replication requests. This, this makes sense. That's, that's why this would avoid any sort of detection. We are injecting a SID history of enterprise domain controller and the domain controller's group. That's it. Nothing very special here. You, if you want, you can find out accounts that have replication rights. We can use something like this. Uh, note that the search basis for my lab, of course, you, you may like to change that when you are running it. So uh, what this Power View command does, it looks for accounts that have replication rights. So take a look at it before you run a DC sync attack. Uh, I think I could show you the DC sync attack as well. I have st still have time. So, so of course you know what the DC sync attack is. So what we are going to do, we are creating a golden ticket with SID history of enterprise domain controllers and domain controllers. That is what we are doing here. That would also serve as a demonstration of golden ticket, forging a right golden ticket. Uh, no, it won't. It won't. So we create a golden ticket with SID history of DCs and enterprise domain controllers. So this injects it in the current session. We are, note that we are using PTT here, pass the ticket. So it gets injected in the current process. And once it is there, we can go ahead. This is for the domain controller. So we can go ahead and request a replication. Note the extra sits here. Domain controllers and enterprise domain controllers. That's what we have here. So now we can simply go ahead and enjoy our DC sync. Absolutely no detection. All right. So yeah, uh, I show that there is no detection, but it actually, actually at least takes a couple of minutes to show up. But yeah, no detection. Uh, one more domain dominance attack that MDI absolutely hate is, of course, golden ticket, as we discussed. So just keep in mind, uh, I've been saying this, I think, within 45 minutes for the third time. <laughs> Make sure that you use, one, AES keys, two, use a valid account, three, your timestamps, that is, not timestamps, uh, the, the ticket renewal, ticket lifetime and ticket renewal lifetime, that setting in your target environment, that should reflect in your tickets. That should not be something that is different. A simple command like this achieves that. All right, so what we have here, make sure that uh, when I say administrator here, make sure that you use a valid domain admin. Administrator would not be the best example. A lot of organizations do not use the built-in DA. I mean, check if they are using it. Many organizations just keep this one as a break glass that is used only in case of emergency. So make sure that what is the actual domain admin that is used, that is active. How do you find that out? Look at logon count and bad password count, bad PWD count attributes. So that would usually be enough unless uh, you are facing, let's say, a very good deception or decoy tool there. I mean, there are ways, but I'm not going to go into that. There are ways to identify still that if it is a valid account or not. But usually in like 99% of the cases, logon count is something that uh, lets you know that, okay, this is a valid one or not. Always check Kerberos, Kerberos policy and make sure, of course, AES keys and make sure that you have your ticket that is TGT lifetime and TGT renewal time set to what the target uses. 
uh, let me show you a demo of this one as well. So I've clubbed all of them together. In a single ticket, of course, we can uh, take care of all of this. So that's this one. So we will uh, forge or create a golden ticket here that uses the AES key of the KRBTGT, sets the ticket lifetime and renewal lifetime to what the target uses and uses, of course, a valid uh, domain admin, an active one. I mean, this is going to be pretty simple, right? We'll run this and then there would be no detection. And to be honest, as I said in the beginning, once you have in front of it, it is actually that simple. And I mean, I lost all hope, to be honest, with ATS slash ATP slash MDI. But then I saw last year that uh, MDI is a trumpet that Microsoft will pull up whenever there is something they can't do anything about. Right? So if there is something that can't be fixed, then OK, here is an MDI detection for it. So that is when I started looking back at it again, that OK, is it really that good now? No, turns out it is not. So. <laughs> It is just, I mean, they have a big suite of, of offerings right now. I mean, do not take otherwise. I, it's not like that I don't like Microsoft. It's just I don't like them. <laughs> so, I mean, not the people there, of course. I mean, I have friends over there, but it, as, an, as an organization, you know, when you work on some, some uh, companies, technology a lot, you have a love and hate relationship with them. You work on that, but you simultaneously hate them to your core. So that's where I am. So no detection here. So that was about the existing alerts. So the, the ones that I felt that are worth looking at. There are many more. For example, if you are using, let's say, NTLM relaying attacks, if you are running a brute force attack, if you are abusing uh, some of the well-known vulnerabilities that are already patched. So that is something that I do not consider part of any uh, careful attacker's playbook at all. So didn't bother to check them, actually, if there is a way to avoid it. What is not detected a lot, actually? I mean, I wanted to place these in phase-wise manners that, OK, this is domain dominance, this is that. But in place of that, I, I want to discuss them all of them together. So for example, diamond ticket, what is diamond ticket? This was originally. Uh, discovered way back in 2015-16, the golden era of Active Directory security research. Uh, but yeah, I mean, never gained traction. Recently, a couple of guys, one from TrustedSec, another one from Semperis, they picked this up, and now this is pretty interesting. So, go, uh, so golden ticket is what? Where you have the Kirby TGT account secrets, and you forge a TGT, you create your own. In case of diamond ticket, if you have the Kirby TGT account secrets, you pick up an existing TGT, decrypt it, make changes to it, encrypt it again, and then send it. So that's a lot more OPSEC safe. There would be a corresponding request for the TGT. That is one of the things that was, I mean, that MDI doesn't use, but few other identity protections use that. If there is no corresponding request for a TGT, that means it's an anomaly. MDI doesn't look at that, but yeah, some of them do. So it avoids that. That's the biggest part. And you need not take care of putting in the right times the TGT lifetime or renewal time, because it would already be there. You are simply injecting something in a valid TGT. You pick it up, decrypt it, make changes, that is SID history usually, and then send it back. A lot more OPSEC safe than golden ticket. I don't see MDI. I mean, it could be the very next day, but I don't see MDI detecting it anytime soon, right? And as I said, silver ticket, that's like the best thing that you would have. Not only for this, uh, for any, for most identity protections on-prem, they don't care about silver ticket. That's a very, uh, you know, ugly brother of golden ticket that no one cares about. That's the ugly duckling. But if you use it against the DD, DC, it's no less than golden ticket and absolutely absolutely silent because the message type is something that no one is looking at or interested in. I mean, I've not done that sort of uh, product development, of course, when it comes to uh, detecting 
uh, silver tickets, but could be one of the engineering reasons, could be too many requests, I'm not sure, but uh, almost nothing detects it, even if you use it against the domain controller. Now, some of the things that I wish that MDI detects is one, delegation configuration. So if you have, let's say, if you, some of them do, if you, let's say, uh, create unconstrained delegation or constrained delegation or domain admin does that, get an alert. If someone configures a resource-based constrained delegation, there should be an alert, absolutely nothing. If you make changes to user account control, like if you force set service, I mean, techniques that have been known for many years now, and if you uh, try to protect on-prem identity, these are exactly the identity-based attacks that attackers have been using for so long. Not only good ones, the bad ones as well. So if you force set SPN, if you force disable, I mean, interestingly, look at the irony of, irony of this. If you look for accounts that have pre-auth disabled, there is an alert. But when you configure that, uh, there is nothing. So if an account that has pre-auth enabled, if it is disabled, I believe, I mean, there should be one. There is nothing like that. Admin SD holder changes, absolutely no alert or detection. Uh, if you inject new SSPs, you know, even the, the archaic Mimikarts one, even that is absolutely, I mean, doesn't trigger anything at all. And replication rights. I mean, this is something that is a bit debatable. Adding of replication rights doesn't trigger anything, but when you use them, carelessly. That does. So the last one is a bit debatable, but uh, yeah, at least adding replication rights doesn't show up anything. Okay. So, and of course, check out my previous presentation and you, you would be unpleasantly surprised that a lot of stuff still works, right? I mean, I was, to be honest, I was worried that would this leak look like that I've just repackaged the talk now and replaced ATA by MDI. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, uh, because of some recon-based alerts, I can claim that, okay, this is something new that I've, I've, I'm showing here. Uh, the last thing that I would like to discuss is, and this is something that I've tested only in my lab right now. So very recently, I think just a couple of months back, Microsoft introduced response action in MDI. That is, uh, if you look that, okay, if you find out that, okay, this user looks like compromised the best option right now would be either to disable this user or reset their password so that whenever they log in again, they need to create a new password. Now, if that configuration is set up, if that is configured, if hybrid identity is in use, that is, there are so many conditions here, and if you compromise a security administrator, a user in Azure that has security administrator role assigned to them, a security administrator can log on to Defender 365 portal go to the user actions, assuming that they do it for the right user or we know it in advance, uh, we reset the password of a user that has a path to domain admin. Does not have the admin count set to one, that is it is not a protected uh, groups member. You reset that, escalate to domain admin, move on to Azure AD Connect, extract the credentials of the directory service sync account and reset the password of a global admin. If, it, if this sounds far-fetched, no, it is not. Get ready to see this in your, uh, one of your nearest threat reports, what, in six months or something, or probably earlier, right? So that is a very valid attack path. I mean, response actions, when I was discussing this yesterday uh, in, my, in my class, I got to know that, okay, something like that can be done using MDE as well, pretty similar to this. So yeah, interesting to have that rat installed on all of your high privilege machines. So finally, what are the limitations of the research? Uh, I looked at only those alerts that are related to functionality abuse, no CVE or patched alerts, or patched uh, vulnerabilities. The noisy attacks like brute force or once again patched vulnerabilities, that is something that I didn't test. ADFS is something that I wanted to, but could not. So probably save it for later. Uh, the whole end-to-end -end testing is done in my lab and with permission, of course, in two of uh, production environments. Some of the alerts I've tested in a few more production environments, but 
think, still think of it as something that is uh, tried in a lab. And probably if you couple MDI with a, f a few more, uh, you know, MDs, defenders, defender something from Microsoft, then it could be a bit more effective. But right now, that is what it is. All right, so I think that would be all from me. Our, do we have any questions here? Questions? Okay. Thank you.